Hi, uh, I'm Tim Anderson. I'm the programming coordinator here at the 29th Annual Florida Film Festival. Welcome to our Filmmaker Forum for uh, Shorts Program Number Five, sponsored by the Orlando Film Commission. Uh, this is a, a phenomenal program this year. We have uh, never had a Shorts Program Number Five in the Florida Film Festival before. Uh, the Competition Shorts Committee met about so probably 10 hours into it. Matthew went home to feed his dog, and while he was gone, we had an executive decision to create an entire additional shorts block while he couldn't really object. Um, therefore, next year, the dog doesn't get fed um, ever <laughs> again, really. So it's, you know, all our fault. But it was an incredible year, really the hardest year I've ever been on shorts to program. Um, the amount of stuff that came in was incredible. For those of you who have a history with the festival, you'll know that the shorts programs get progressively weirder. Um, and shorts program number five sort of replaces the notorious shorts program number four, uh, which used to be called Midnight Junior or Midnight Light. Um, and these are definitely some of the most cutting edge shorts that we have in the festival um, this year. So I would love to introduce the filmmakers that are here uh, representing their work and then we'll get everything kind of going with some Q&A. So let me start with April. Hi, I'm April. I'm the writer director of Guilt. Uh, Thomas. Hey, I'm Tomas. Uh, I'm the writer and director of Museum of Fleeting Wonders. Devin. Hello, my name is Devin Diffenderfer. I'm the uh, writer and also co-directed it with my friend Ari Itkin, who unfortunately can't be here today, but we both wanted to say uh, what an honor it is to be a part of the Florida Film Festival. Thank you. Hey, Devin. Uh, Tyler. Hi, I'm, I'm Tyler Macri. I'm the writer and director of Pond. Kevin. Welcome back, Kevin. Thanks for having me. I am Kevin P. Alexander. I am the writer-director of Boys and Toys. I'm uh, excited. If you guys saw Trashy last year at the Florida Film Festival, you've already seen some of Kevin's issues, so, <laughs> of which I'm sure we can get involved with very soon. So, go on. Uh, yep, Jawan Brown with uh, Museum of Fleeting Wonders, creative producer. Uh, brings us down to Kyle. Hey, I'm Kyle. I'm the uh, director of The Door and uh, co-writer and producer, Rachel Emmerich, who also did it with me. She can't make it today, but uh, thank you for having me. And Michael. Hey, Michael Shumway with uh, director of Last Quinn on Earth, and I have... I'm the writer, Lex Hogan. Nice. Well, thank you nice. guys so much for joining us. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, shorts program number five this year, uh, definitely something put together by the team that represented what we kind of considered to be the most, not, I want to say interesting, because it makes it sound like you just watched four previous programs of shorts that were totally uninteresting. Uh, but it, it's just definitely about a program that we felt like pushes a lot of buttons and a lot of boundaries um, and does it in a way that we think is just like super duper interesting. Um, I've got a lot to say really about everyone's films here, um, and I'm really proud of this program um, that we put together. Um, and I guess I will start with April, and I'm kind of going to pose to everybody essentially kind of the same basic question of this. Um, but going to April, we, um, you know, last year we saw a short of yours, Florida Girls, and we loved it, and it's just one of those kind of moments where like it just, the mat we couldn't make it work, and it just kind of couldn't slip into the festival. And so I know we spoke last year and I was really excited to see about what you had been working on and you came up with guilt, which is, um, man, it's tough. This is a tough short. So I guess uh, for everybody, I'm gonna want the same kind of question, but it's really a little bit about the inspiration behind why you decided to give of your life and your money and your cast and crew's time to tell this story. Um, so April, uh, take it away. Yeah, so I really wanted to tell a story about, you know, young women and especially young women in the South who don't have access to, you know, abortion clinics. And so I really wanted to show how without that access, you are forced into these very like dangerous and life threatening situations in order just to have some kind of agency over your life. Um, and so I really wanted to show kind of the raw intenseness of that. 
Like it's raw. There's no question about it. I mean, this is a movie that sort of lives and dies by by tension. Like the atmosphere on it's so thick, and the sense of impending dread is like that's a tough, tough short. And you did an incredible job. And your cast is. We'll, we'll talk about everybody's cast soon, but just what what they don't say speaks volumes in this short. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Tomas, man, you know. I don't even know where to start. This film is, it's the closest thing that we're playing this year that's art. Like on screen, it's not playing in an experimental block. And I, and there was a, you know, there was definitely some debate amongst us whether we felt to classify the film as an experimental short. Um, but really there's, I mean, obviously everything is very specifically, it has a narrative to it. Um, and the, the style of course of the film is really what speaks you know, to the volumes to what you guys are doing. So this is really one where I want to know a lot about why, how you guys approached it and sort of why you decided to do this. Cause it's like a Instagram feed come to life. Really. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, I think that's the genesis of the project that I, um, I really wanted to try and provide content on social media that wasn't just like selfies and, uh, photos of your food and stuff like that, that just, I, I just wanted to see content that was like more intriguing, more mysterious in some way. And um, I just felt like social media is like a really cool platform where people could share stories. Uh, and, and so what I'm interested in and in, in the project that uh, Juan and I are developing together as a feature, it's a very magical realist in the most like Latin American magical realist tone. And so I wanted to try my hand at, at exercising that tone and at the same time working with uh, uh, non-actors. Yeah. And so what I started to do was collect from friends and family and my own little, just little stories of, of moments where you feel like there's a glitch in the matrix, you know, that we all experience little moments that are just slightly off, you know, a little bit more absurd than natural. And, uh, not, you know, the big, miraculous, life-saving, life-changing moments, but rather concentrate on the minute ones. And in that way, kind of uh, create a, a little bit of a collection, like a curated collection of little magical moments to see if there's like a pattern there. And by like putting them all together, maybe people could bring their own stories as well. So this is really, we made the film version as a kind of trial run for something that I eventually hope is more of a multimedia project. Yeah. Hmm. I think that's really what the film does in such a phenomenal way, which is this idea that like, um, you know, if you were scrolling an Instagram feed and you saw a picture and you wanted to know a little bit more of the story behind the picture, what your film is kind of giving everyone is not the actual story, but a little bit more context that what you're seeing is maybe, you know, just scratching the surface of what's going on. And that's what I like, especially specifically about the crying segment is that, you know, the film that doesn't need to explain anything about what's happening in those moments in the film. It's just like kind of this moment where like you, what you watching is like to a degree voyeuristic. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, intensely like personal and very uh i don't know if i'm losing the word i'm trying to come up with but yeah <laughs> it, it blew me away like i was totally stunned by by the short when we saw it the first time thank you appreciate that a lot Devin, your film went exactly where we thought it was gonna go but it didn't get to that point in a way that it seemed obvious like I think the whole time anyone's watching Love You, Tyler, it seems like, well, of course this is where this is going to end up. But you keep waiting. That twist in your film is that it doesn't twist necessarily, um, except for this final little moment that happens right at the end. So um, again, I want to kind of talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, um, it, was, uh, it was interesting. I mean, how I wrote it, you know, um, with the, uh, I guess, inspiration. Well, first, you know, I, I initially wrote it because I just wanted to act in something um, because I'm an actor first, and this is my first uh, short film. Um, and I have other friends who do short films, and so they inspired me to do one. 
And um, I started with dialogue. I didn't have an outline. So I just wrote it, you know, took me a couple nights. And uh, as I wrote the dialogue, I kind of came up with it. And writing it, you know, it was kind of like a, you know, a roller coaster of, you know, where I can take it. Um, I knew I wanted to do a, a two person, you know, roommate comedy, um, you know, because I had a low budget. So I wanted, you know, uh, one location. And um, I wanted to have a twist at the end as I wrote it. Um, I, you know, as I was writing it, even in the beginning, I was like, you know, he, he actually does, he does love, he, he, he does like Tyler, his roommate, but he also really does have a girlfriend named Tyler. <laughs> and that can be confusing. Um, and so I guess, I don't know, I guess I wanted people to kind of look at it and either want more or, you know, or some people look at it and go, what the what? <laughs> um, so, you know, it's been interesting to see what, you know, who, you know, what, what people's reactions are on it. I mean, I definitely feel like we as the audience are rooting for the roommates to hook up. Like we want them, yeah. we want them to find happiness together. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, that brings me to Tyler. Um, this movie, it's beautiful. It, um, it's haunting. And it's one of these films that we, when we watched it, you know, there's an idea of watching a film and you're so immersed in the environment that you can sort of, uh, or I guess we would say for better or worse, you could almost smell what it is like to be inside of this movie. Not a good smell. And <laughs> yeah, and that's really kind of what, you know, people definitely commented on this that watched it in selections that were like, you know, they weren't really positive exactly what was going on. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't want you to, explain the film any more than I think it needs because I think it stands very well on its own but it's 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 a movie that reminded me very much of a film I championed years a couple years ago We the Animals which I think has just got an incredibly like very real kind of thing going on inside of it that's just like makes you yeah. step back and go holy crap yeah 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 I think kind of um like s similar to the way Tomas put it we we kind of started with a specific brand of magical realism um more in the polish direction um that we were interested in uh experimenting with um and i think at the time the person who who really kicked off the writing of the screenplay this um this writer um bruno schultz who did um street of crocodiles and he has these stories about uh, told from the perspective of a child whose father turns into a um, a scorpion and is running around in the house and they're trying to kill it and they don't know what to do with it. And um, it was kind of a mix of being really inspired by that kind of art and thinking a little bit about, I get, which I didn't know the term at the time, but I'm now um, familiar with the term screen memories and how um, traumatic events from childhood can be filtered through um, more fantastic um, uh, imagery. Um, it's the way, you know, the way that the mind kind of deals with it and applying that to uh, the cinematography of the film. So it was really kind of a big experiment at the time. Um, we shot it very much out of order and yeah, oh, the okay. pond, that is the, uh, the result. <laughs> How did, I, I know we'll get into this a little bit more, but I'm really interested about this location that you guys shot this in. Like, um, like all of them or which, which one no, specifically? Primarily the, primarily the house. The house. Um, so I shot the film during my last year at Ithaca College where okay. I graduated. Um, and there are a lot of older homes in Tompkins County yeah. um, and in New England in general on the East Coast. Um, and the kitchen, it, it, usually in, in these films, it's kind of the house ends up being a mix of different rooms yeah. from similar houses but um it was it was a ground floor apartment um by a river um and it had all its original fixtures but it was actually the editor's father's um oh, wow. apartment yeah so so we 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 stayed for like two days afterwards trying to get the smell of rotten fish out of there and, and i caught a lot of flack for that but um yeah um so it was yeah it was actually a family friends um place that's really interesting uh okay let's bring it over to kevin um Man, 
this we laughed our asses off watching boys and toys like i mean i don't know if thank we you laughed thank more at any other movie that we put into into the competition this year than than this movie it's like everyone it's like the worst nightmare come to life like short um and again it's like it, it doesn't necessarily it subverts the expectations to some degrees here and there even though you can kind of feel like you you know when the shoe's about to drop uh, but it still just kind of nails it and I, I think that's always a successfully written short is if you know you can still anticipate what's going to occur but when it's done that's still satisfying yeah, thanks. I mean, that's that's actually exactly how I describe it as as worst nightmare comedy, um, the cringiest moment. Uh, as you know, I mean, I've done a couple very short sort of yeah. awkward, awful relationship comedies, and I just was basically trying to expand that world um, to give a little context to the to the two central characters, yeah. and to yeah, just really up the comedy, but also make it even more relatable and awkward maybe yeah this one comes to me out of a place where like i i, I really feel like I, the the whole of this it, there's so much more of this film that like could exist in the world and we'll talk a little bit about that with everybody i think coming up but yeah it's just one of those things where like this is such a segment of like the most awkward rom-com like probably ever yeah, it actually, the, the, the basic idea began as a feature, and I, I can't do a feature, so I, I, I compressed it to a short and just wound up cha essentially changing all the characters because, you know, the arc just has to be different in a yeah. short. And, but the basic idea was originally a feature. So, right, smart guy, Tim. <laughs> it's like I watch movies for a living. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> like, <laughs> Who, who would have known? Yeah. Kyle, um, let's bring it over to you as well. Um, hey! This is the, you know, every year I feel like we put something into the festival, and this is probably just because I'm such a huge horror movie fan, and I, you know, Kat, I, I know loves horror stuff too, and we're to, all of us are, I think all like really snobby film programmers are really cult horror movie buffs. <laughs> um, and this is kind of the closest thing we have in the festival this year in competition that does play out essentially like a horror movie. Oh, cool. Um, but obviously the basics behind it are very much uh, tr about trauma. So I'd love mm. to talk uh, a little bit about, again, I got the inception on this film. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it was, you know, it was an idea. I remember it, uh, who also starred in it. And um, I kind of put out the first draft and we wrote it together and we went up to Vermont, just shot it. And it was like a four man crew. Um, and we scheduled it for two and a half days and ended up filming it for six days. Um, Cause I forgot what it's like to shoot on film. Uh, yeah. But um, it turned out to be just like a really, it was really hard work because a, we're such a small crew, but yeah. also, um, you know, just, we just building the intensity of it um, systematically how I wanted to shoot it. Um, but it turned out great. We're like all happy, happy about it. Nice. Yeah, I think the things people forget is how much lighting it takes to shoot a movie that's that dark. Yeah, <laughs> especially on film. Yeah. yeah. Um, Michael, the last queen on, I, I don't remember where in the process we were when we saw the last queen on earth, but I do know that when we sat down in the final deliberations, which for shorts competition takes somewhere in like the 14 hour range, uh, we just were not allowed to leave until we have a program. Um, Sounds horrible. It's yeah. It's, <laughs> it, there's probably a movie in it, but no one would want to watch it. Um, it's like a Lars von Trier movie in there somewhere. Um, I do know that when we go around the room, we do a unanimous, and I do believe your film was the first vote unanimous like thing that went in. Like there was no, like you were the first thing on the list. Like they were like everybody last queen on earth and it was a hundred percent yes across the board um and i appreciate that it's a it's an amazingly good movie like it's it's really phenomenal um it it's just like 
the, I wrote the blurb on it, and I, I mean, I, it's just this idea of living your best life in the zombie apocalypse, I guess, essentially. So, yeah, talk. Oh. I mean, just uh, what what inspired you guys? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just we loved the idea of a of a story that was kind of set in your traditional stereotypical apocalyptic world, and then kind of turning it on on its head and doing a bit of a a genre bender because our character himself is a bit of a, a, a gender bender per se. Um, we, for me, the biggest thing we were trying to convey really was this idea of um, you just have, there's so many shades of gray in people and you have things that are traditionally masculine or traditionally feminine. And what would it be like if somebody just really explored those parts of themselves? I know we're always kind of, everyone likes to be kind of in a box or, or is put into a box that they don't want to be in and having a character that, you know, if he had nobody judging him, if he had no social construct, what would he choose to do with his time and what would he explore that maybe he's had social pressure not to explore. Um, and so it was really just kind of an exploration of, of that idea. Um, what about for you? Um, yeah. Also, I mean, just, always between the two binaries on everything, even horror and comedy, um, ugly things and beautiful things, all of that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's why I love this project. <laughs> I mean, the film's fantastic in terms of like, it, it, everybody here has kind of created a movie that exists in an absolutely totally realized world, but yours is like so much larger in scope to a degree than some of the other things that are a, lot, a little more concentrated inside of this block. Um, but what I really think I like about this movie is the, this idea of the sort of almost desaturation of the world that he's living in as, but as he sort of starts to, you know, come out of his shell a little more, I don't want to say it like sounds so cliche, but you know, like, um, there's just this idea, there's these little iconic scenes that exist inside the movie, like, you know, the he scenes with the heels and like there's just it's great and then obviously it kind of at the in the end it becomes essentially you know you're kind of walking dead s kind of like moment where like oh shit now the people have shown up and you know like yeah yeah well we love i mean even from a cinematography standpoint we wanted to start very desaturated and yeah. a lack of color and then have the color come from him as he develops yeah. the character yeah. yeah it's really but you know like fully realized incredibly well done um Gosh, um, I mean, I've got a million things I know I want to ask, but I actually want to maybe throw it to Matthew and Kat and see if there's anything that they want to jump in on. Um, I'm good. Not yet. Not yet. Kat? Nope. Way to put me on the spot. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't... <laughs> That's what I'm here for. That's... I don't have anything specifically right now, but I'm sure I will think of something as we go along. <laughs> okay. Well, then actually, this is a really good chance for me to sort of like, like I said, because we could just talk forever. But maybe I would like, since you guys have had a chance essentially to see each other's work, uh, maybe I'd like to open it up to you guys and see if there's anything you specifically want to ask each other about your own projects. So, and you can just, uh, you know, shake your hand and click yourself in and go for it. Who wants to take the take the leap? Oh, don't be shy. Kyle, you didn't do it? Go for it. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, uh, for Boys and Toys, I'm just curious, did that story come from somewhere, somehow in New York? Like or just... Um, it's it's thankfully not based on a completely <laughs> true story. But there are, there, are, there are yeah, there are different elements of it that uh that are taken for real life for real. And actually that's a good point. It is a very real, it is very New York in the sense that, especially like myself, if you grew up in New York and you stay in New York, you're more connected to your parents than you like to admit in sort of an embarrassing way. And obviously New York is very expensive. Sometimes yeah. you live with your parents longer than you should. And it causes all kinds of problems. You know, you, you realize like you and your 30 year old friends, like, still hang out at your parents' house. I mean, I love, I love that she's so broke, essentially. She still lives at home at 30 and like, like. Yeah, I mean, but on the other sense, she's like mature, she's a professor yeah. and she's like, but that's, that's the sort of weird dichotomy. It's like, yeah. it's kind of hard not to be broke unless you really aren't, you know? Yeah. This wasn't I about love... you, Kevin, was it? 
What's that? This wasn't about you. It wasn't a fantasy you were living out. Oh, uh, it's definitely. I hope it's not a fantasy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it depends on which character you are. I think. <laughs> well, well, that's interesting because I usually, you know, obviously the the lusting after the babysitter is usually the younger guy being like, "Oh, I want to have sex with my babysitter." So I thought it would be more interesting if it's like the older woman is like, "Oh, he's an adult now, technically." <laughs> let, me lust, <laughs> let me let me lust after him. Mm. So I like the flip flip of that but of course it doesn't it doesn't work out as it should no that's really good um anyone else curious who wrote the who wrote the music for the door uh uh, well that was actually kind of um some of it was purchased um from art list uh i just find their rates to be incredible um uh so yeah because we're we're on such a tight budget, um, that's kind of where I sourced a lot of the music and just like saw what fit for what I was going for. I mean, yeah, I thought the tone was really great. I really appreciated that for sure. Oh, uh, thank you. I mean, a lot of it too is like we wanted to also score with sound effects. I mean, that was kind of a big thing about it too. And just like I, I don't know the exact term for it, but. Um, they call it but like where sound effects can be considered like music for just like a lot of that that's kind of where our mindset was when kind of scoring this and putting it together thank you um i actually want to jump in i want to ask april a question because this is kind of interesting um this is the first one of these q a's that we've done if you guys get a chance to watch the other previous ones where um, oh, way over 60% of the competition choice program this uh, festival is actually uh, directed by women filmmakers, but April somehow managed to be the only women, woman that is programmed in shorts program number four. And the film is, five. I want to talk a little, sorry, <laughs> shorts program number five. I don't know what day it is. Um, and I think it's interesting because if you, you guys have I've seen each other's shorts and you can see this kind of through line that exists inside of all of them um, to a degree there, they've all have a degree of really interesting, real, gritty realism to them um, uh, with some kind of universally odd elements um, that could be seen as magical realism or could be seen as sort of, you know, kind of not necessarily supernatural, but certainly um, maybe otherworldly is probably a, quite a, stretch to say but um this is the one because you're you're right the idea behind your film is this just again this is sort of a dystopian future it's like this is sort of what could happen if the you know supreme right has their way and all access to to health care is is gone um well actually unfortunately this does happen yeah. <laughs> This well, yes, like, definitely depending on where, where you live, for sure. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of cases, unfortunately, because out-home abortions, you know, they aren't, uh, rep- you know, there's not a lot of reporting done on them, on them. Um, but there have been, you know, news articles here and there that talk about how terrible this is that some young women resort to methods like this. So, unfortunately, we're living in this time. <laughs> you know, that's- Definitely. <laughs> um, <But> yeah. <laughs> I guess w- one of the questions I just I want to have with you about this was kind of the approach that you had with your casting, uh, your two leads, um, and the dynamic that they had, sort of in the lead up to shooting and on the set during the actual like kind of, you know, actual production. Yeah, I mean, I think. You know, John Louis, who plays uh, Kyle, he is very loose and he's so charming and he's such a delight to be around. And Amber is so, like, she has this amazing quiet intensity about her that I think is just so fascinating to watch on screen. And so it was really just about, you know, using their strengths and what they brought to the character and you know, I obviously during, uh, we only had one day of rehearsal and okay. I let them, yeah, and we, it was only a two day shoot. It was a very intense, crazy two day shoot. But during rehearsal, I really let them, you know, I wanted to see what they were getting from the text. And then on, you know, on the day, really 
craft it to where, you know, I was getting what I wanted, but also bringing what they were bringing to the character and finding that medium and, you know, fitting their two very unique ways of approaching acting, you know, fitting them together. It was, it was a really fun challenge for me. Okay. Yeah. I was just really curious because I mean, the movie has got, I mean, it's obviously it's very, what it's trying to do is very deliberate in the way that it's it's shot and the way that you know kind of the tone exists on si- in, in, inside of the film is is very very exacting um and so it's just, yeah i think they you, all the casts in these films really did an amazing job um you know kind of pulling off the degrees of intensity and absurdity that are, are required depending on on the short that they were they were a part of um, so maybe a kind of overall kind of question about to everybody um, about, you know, how you guys did come about finding your leads. Um, you know, we have a lot of film school students that watch this and one of the harder things and certainly in Central Florida is to cast well. Um, and, you know, you guys obviously all did a bang up job casting. So um, I'm going to start a little bit with Tomas because obviously a lot of your characters performances are essentially silent. Um, inside of the film and then just maybe go down the line with everybody um, on casting question. Oh, you're still on, you're still on mute, Tom. Tomas. There you go. Um, Sorry about that. So, yeah, so what we were trying to do a lot uh, here was to, like, like I said earlier, to experiment working with non-actors and, um, since it was, there's no dialogue in the film at all. And so um, we were just looking for somebody who felt real, you know? I think some, sometimes, at least for me, a lot of actors are just simply too uh, stereotypically good looking. And I'm, I'm looking for real faces because this, this uh, story, it, it, the magical realism, it, the, the, for the magic to feel real, the people needed to feel real. And so there's there's a mix of everything you can imagine. There's there's some there's a couple of actual real uh, trained actors sprinkled throughout. Mm-hmm. For example, the laughing nun. Um, she we did a casting call where all we did was ask, like ask people to laugh. And uh, Kwan and I sat there and listened to maybe thirty people just come in and start laughing and laughing and laughing. And then this woman's uh, laugh was absolutely infectious and we could not stop laughing as we heard it. So that was how we picked her. But then, uh, for example, the, the, the woman who sees the bird who's trapped inside the window, um, she is my friend's aunt. And she's a, she's a second grade teacher. She has no idea about uh, acting. And she had a long time ago at a, like a Thanksgiving thing that I got invited to his house and said like, one day you put me in one of your movies. So I, uh, I came back and I was like, today's this day. You fulfilled, you fulfilled the <laughs> and, problem. Um, and yeah, uh, for example, there's, there's a short that didn't make it into the cut that we showed at Florida. Um, but one of them was literally, uh, we went, we were scouting. We stopped by a taco place and the guy who, who uh, the cook came out and just started talking to us and he was really nice. And, um, and I thought he was such a character. I was like, would you be down to act in something? And he, he, was, he loved it. And he came out and, and he was part of the, the process as well. So really it's like about, and, and that was really beautiful for me. It was like looking around and finding characters, you know, and not looking for actors, but rather finding characters. And so that you're discovering what's already there rather than trying to mold something into, into the, into the process. I don't know, uh, K1, if I'm missing anything that I could be covering in this, in this yeah. uh, response. No, I think, I think that that's right on. I, I think, and like Tim mentioned earlier, kind of the idea of like looking at a photograph and this is almost like seeing a little bit before and after potentially a moment. There's a lot about a photograph that you automatically understand just from the look of someone, right? Um, their type of personality that just comes out through their look. So um, that, was definitely critical because it's such a short moment with such a simple kind of series of events happening. You sort of need that face to tell a large part of the story anyway. Uh, Devin, other than looking in the mirror, um, like talk about other parts. That was an intense audition when I was in the 
<laughs> mirror I remember. Do you, do you um, ever feel I, like you're just not enough? <laughs> you know, I had a few callbacks and I thought to myself, can I get this role? And uh, I finally, thankfully got it. And um, the, so I only had to cast one other, and it was Tyler and it was um, one of my good friends who was in class as me. Um, okay. the, the whole film was like basically shot from, with friends uh, from Brooklyn or um, people that were, that I knew from school, the, the, the school I went to. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, I just wanted to, I thought could play the role and, you know, was a good actor and, you know, I think he's an attractive fellow and somebody I, you know, was like, oh, I could kiss Ryan, you know, so, uh, <laughs> so <yeah. laughs> that's it. That's fair enough. Did you guys, um, is this like a, this one, two day shoot? You guys just shoot in location you already had? Just, just, uh, just one day, uh, thankfully. Yeah. Okay. Just one day in Brooklyn. No, it's a good example. I mean, I love being able to put shorts up to, you know, show audiences, but also to show film school students that, you know, you don't have to, you know, have, you know, 70 setups and 20 locations and spend five days shooting your short. Like if you can find, you know, one other person or two other people and knock this thing out in an apartment and really gets like, you know, drive home story. Um, I mean, shorts are all, you know, if you're not going to live and die completely on their style, they have to live and die out, like, entirely on their story. Um, and, you know, you guys are good examples of kind of that, you know, even like, in Tomas's film, you know, even though there's no, you know, basic narrative through line on everything, you know that there, you know, the story that's kind of being told um, in it, and they do that in very efficient ways. Um, Tyler, your film is the most kind of, uh, almost atmospheric and ethereal of this as well, and I'm kind of curious about, you know, what you, not only casting, but more what you asked of your performers. Mm -hmm. um, to get what you're um, going for. Yeah, so Ellie um, was 11 at the time and I had worked with her very briefly when I was a junior. Um, she was like a local child actor from Ithaca and did theater. Um, so we were already friends. I'm pretty close with um, the mother as well who works at the school. Um, and Rachel, who plays her mother, um, was just a backstage find. I think I had to go through like 400 submissions to find, you know, a few people worth yeah. um, getting together with. And the first um, rehearsal between the two of them, uh, we went into that older kitchen that ended up being featured in the film and uh, filmed them digitally, like gutting a carp in the sink. And we just wanted them to do really bizarre things yeah. um, and settle into the mundanity of those things. Um, so the rehearsals um, looked like that. And then they would tell stories with each other about what they imagined um, their, her grandmother was like and what had happened to the father and what was going on around the house and just kind of creating something in our minds that was bigger than what physically the film ends up um, kind of portraying. And then the other children in the film that are seen when Ellie goes out of the house, um, I actually found almost all of them in one night uh, the summer before I was um, doing some G and E work on a grad film that was shooting in Ithaca okay. and we were shooting in a, um, an apartment complex and it was at like one in the morning, but all these people were letting their kids run outside and kind of swarm the set because they were so curious. Yeah. So I was setting up a generator and I had like a 2K um, and these kids like just desperately wanted to help me and wanted to learn about uh, the technical side of lighting. And I kind of had to keep them at arm's length because I didn't want any children to get electrocuted. Yeah. But I was like, you know, if you're interested in film, uh, I have this thing I've been writing. Maybe I can come back and we can talk about it. We can talk about your with, about it with your parents. And um, we came back four months later and um, they were all still there and they were all very open. And uh, we just kind of went through these different rail yards in the area and yeah. just asked them to show us the kind of stuff that they did when they, they were allowed to, oh. you know, uh, play a little further from home. Yeah, <laughs> that's really cool. 
Um, I've definitely got one other question on yours as well. Um, yesterday we had a Q&A with uh, the filmmaker for uh, Thirsty, and she had a mosquito wrangler for her movie. I need to know if you guys had a like kind of fish, a fish wrangler. wrangler. <laughs> So yeah, a, an informal fish wrangler. So we there, there's a fish farm in Ithaca, and I just called the guy up and I said, uh, you know, do you have do you have dead fish? Do do a lot of these die in the breeding process? And he said, yeah. And I said, could you throw them in like a bucket of ice water for me, and I'll pick them up, you know, tomorrow. And um, I I told him, you know, I'll buy a few live ones, but I have no intention of keeping them. So I'm going to return them to you afterwards. So we got the dead ones free. We got some live ones. And then I just ended up bringing them back to him. Um, no, fi no fish were harmed in the making. No fish were harmed. Yeah, yeah. We didn't want any fish blood on our hands. Right. Um, so, but um, yeah, they all came from a a guy who was a breeder who like stocks ponds in the area. Um, but they were just, yeah, they were being kept in like, all sorts of weird containers, whatever we had. I think the main container was just a big storage bin, but like in the film, you know, some of them ended up in bell jars and pots yeah. and pans. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was something else. <laughs> How many actual fish did you end up using? Um, oh, well, I forget the, the, the garfish, the big one as well. That, that was shipped in from a, um, oh, yeah. uh, a fishmonger in New York, um, which I guess people eat garfish. I have no idea why they had them. Um, but I think probably over 20, uh, there were a ton of fish. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Kevin, um, I mean, you're, you're, I've recognized some of your, your performers, so, um, but you know, I just kind of know about yeah, right. you know, putting them together. So. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I, I worked with a casting director who I met through a friend. Um, I self-casted before, but just you know, having the professional who can think of people who are, they're just going to have way better resources than I have. And I was lucky to work with her. And it was all just about finding the right blend in chemistry. Because, um, you know, it's pretty dialogue heavy. And um, actually, I mean, maybe of all the films, mine is the least sort of naturalistic, would you say, maybe? It's more... Uh, actorly performance i'm not like catching real moments i don't know yours is, uh, yeah. to me it i wouldn't say that's necessarily true but to me yours is just definitely feels a little bit like a wrong oh, it, yours is like a rom yeah gone wrong like, right 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 for sure like there's yeah. a heightened sense of reality to it to some degree but i don't think that it feels non-natural Okay. Good. Like I was trying to. Put, I was trying to put myself down, and you're bringing me back up. That's good. <laughs> nobody uh, does anything in your movie that I wouldn't believe they wouldn't right, do. Right. If this shit was actually what was happening to them. <laughs> like, no, that's. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, no, I think the key, especially for a short, is finding the chemistry because you yeah. have such a little amount of time, and they just basically meet each other on set, and it's like. Um, so you just sort of have to calculate in your head can i see these two people together is that going to work and that's you know. yeah that's kind of what i was wondering is if you guys had any rehearsal or pre-pro with those or if they literally just walked on like one day and it was like hi so we're doing scenes together uh we did have we did have one basically read through okay. so they weren't completely fresh to each other yeah. but still i feel like they got to know each other on set um, okay you know we had an hour rehearsal basically so um yeah and kyle yours is obviously a little unique in that you know essentially it's one person so um you know yeah. i want to talk a little bit about that obviously as well and then what you you know a little bit too much uh, again about uh, capturing the kind of performance that you you were going for sure um well i mean rachel who is in it uh the one actress um she was my co-writer and co-producer so i mean no matter what she's going in it but um I think her and I talked about it. Um, she, in her history of acting, always kind of got pigeonholed in certain roles. And she was looking for something really dramatic. Um, and we both talked about it. And one element that she really brought to the table, which I was on board for, and we talked about the writing process, was um, showing so much of what was going on without saying it. Yeah. And we really and it, it's it was different for me because i love writing comedy i love writing dialogue 
And she just was the right person to portray all that without saying very little. Um, and especially we, we talked about um, the one shot in the film where she's kind of a little flustered coming back from this funeral. She, you know, she's trying to set the house right, make it, you know, everything kind of um, um, put everything back under control or somewhat control in her life. And she has that moment in bed. And I think it just says it all right there in her performance of what is going on in her mind. And we both wanted that. And um, it, it was, it was great because um, she put a lot of work into it. When you have an actor or actress who really focuses on the craft and knowing what to do um, physically and emotionally um, makes the process so much easier. And um, it was, it was a great, um, how can I say, um, it was just a great experience working with her on that. Um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. No, no, that's fantastic. Um, Michael, this one is kind of something that I, I really was thinking about the more and more I was thinking about the performance that your, 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 your lead gave, um, was whether you guys sort of built the transformation based on the actor you cast, or if you helped mold that actor's look to the transformation you guys were kind of going for, because obviously your, your lead has a very unique kind of look about him you know he's obviously he's not a polished polished pretty boy kind of you know actor this is a kind of you know disheveled looking dude um no you know no shade but uh you know it's it's to me that works so much more interesting as the lipstick goes on and and you know the eyelashes and what have you so yeah i think it's a little bit of both um so our producer, Jonathan Green, actually brought us, well, he told us about a guy that had grown up in rural Texas on a farm, on a ranch, and was now actually a working actor in Los Angeles, no, excuse me, um, in LA. So we actually contacted him and yeah, he just had this great mix of just, he was just an authentic person, yeah. right? Just very down to earth, um, very gracious with both his acting and, and giving us what we needed. And, and like everyone knows, uh, this process is a collaboration. And, you know, when, when Lex was writing the script and we had kind of an idea of what the film was at that point, and then as you're getting on set and seeing the set, seeing the actors and the, you know, the set dressing and the cinematography, I mean, everything just kind of starts to, it becomes something outside of yourself. And Travis was really able to bring that character to life in a way that we didn't anticipate honestly and it and it made it better than what we had thought it would be yeah i think the main criteria to find someone who was a little rugged and someone yeah. kind of on the far spectrum from femininity or what you think yeah. uh, but i think what we were pleasantly surprised by was how uh warm travis was and the kind of soulfulness he has in his eyes because i don't think i was expecting as something as you know as serendipitous as that like to have that human co human connection um so yeah we were completely happy like so happy with him yeah and thankfully he uh he had already done a role where he played a drag queen oh okay project and uh yeah. so he had already spent time in heels and we put him in heels <laughs> for another month before the shoot and then he was able to run in the mud with hills, which made us super happy. Yeah, I feel like in his previous drag queen for us, he probably wasn't running through fields and heels. <laughs> so like, oh, that was that was new for him for sure, and it was freezing. We were in uh, in Oregon in the early spring, late winter, and uh, yeah, it was we put him through a lot, but he was a trooper for sure. Yeah, yeah, I feel also, like you put most dudes in heels. Like the chance of breaking your ankle is like really high, yeah. and like then yeah. you like basically get him slopping around like a field. <laughs> Yeah, but what's funny is after he was kind of fake running, like having a hard time running through the field, and then as soon as we called cut, he was walking like a champ. Like, <laughs> yeah, he almost had to pretend to act like he yeah. couldn't walk in hills. Yeah, so. uh. that's great. Well, I, again, I think it, it again it, it is one of those things where like the performance that exists there like feels so genuine, and you really can kind of see this like inner light kind of start to shine through. Um, as the film you know progresses before it 
goes crazy at the end, which is a lot of fun, of course, as well. Um, Ash, I want to open. I, I I know we can't do this forever, and we do need to wrap up pretty soon. But um, I I would love to open this back up to you guys again. And if there's anything you you want to specifically say about your film, um, you know anything that we didn't touch on here, um, I'm gonna give a shout. I got a quick question oh, man, for everybody. Please. I got a quick question. So all of these films are kind of hit that sweet spot as far as running time goes. They're between nine minutes and 15, 16 minutes, which we love as programmers. There's uh, not a lot of extraneous stuff. There's really no waste. These are compact, concise, really tight, um, you know, beautifully done short films, which is great. But, uh oh, hang on. I'm on low power. Um, am I back? Okay, good. So I was just curious because it came up with one of the other um, Q and A's and one of the other shorts programs. Were there any scenes that you guys ended up cutting that you kind of regret, or you know, you you're happy with the final film, but you really miss having that particular scene? I know Tomas said in an earlier version of Museum of Fleeting Wonders there was another, at least one other sequence uh, to the to the museum to the story. Uh, that we didn't get to see, but I'm curious if in any of these other films there was a, a like a key scene or something that that was special that still ended up on the cutting room floor. Anything you cut usually makes it better in my experience. So, so everybody killed their babies April literally, <laughs> literally, um, and we're happy about Jesus. that. I had to go there; it was just too easy. <laughs> I definitely like we almost cut like the last shot of her laying down in the truck because we didn't get a lot oh. of time to mm. film it because it was it was poor so we only had two days to shoot it was pouring rain the whole time and there was tornado warnings and then you know like a cow got loose in the middle of shooting <laughs> and it was so hard <laughs> but you know we didn't get a lot of time to like do that shot the way I wanted to but I also think that you know you kind of you know those things that maybe you don't get enough as much time as you want it does like as long as the emotion is there it works mm. I'm glad that scene made it because that's a great shot to wrap that up. Yeah, that up. shot's awesome. Thank so, you. like, thank, thank you for not cutting that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my producer really fought me on that. I was like, put it back in. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Well, um, any last words from anybody else on, on their films? Thanks for having us. We appreciate wow. the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Like I said, it means a lot to us that you guys took some time to get together uh, and do this. Um, obviously, the world's you know a mess right now, um, and hopefully, everybody got to the theater, got to watch these movies at home, got a little bit of escapism, a little bit to think about. Um, and be sure if you guys uh, watched these to vote for the audience award um, for these movies, and keep an eye out for these filmmakers. Uh, they're incredible talent and uh, we were just really excited to get a chance to showcase their work here at the Blood Film Festival this year. So thank you again uh, to you guys for coming out and uh, you know we'll catch you on the next Q&A. Thank you. Thanks.